The views expressed on the following broadcasts do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT, Take 12 Radio, or our affiliates. The opinions on this show should not be considered as medical, psychological, or professional advice and are those of the host, co-host, and guest. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. One day at a time with its failures and fears With portion of pain and burden of care Welcome to Walking Through the Language of the Heart. A journey into the grapevine writings of Alcoholics Anonymous co-founder, Bill W. And now, here are your co-hosts, Chris S. and the Monty Man. Well, welcome back, one and all. It's good to have you with us. Chris uh, S. is on the line uh, with us, and uh, we are ready to crack open another article uh, amongst the grapevine writings of Bill W. in the book, The Language of the Heart. Chris, what are we doing this week, buddy? Wow. Well, Monty, this is the last article in the second section. Uh, next week, we're going to be on section three, if you can imagine. Yeah. It's, yeah. I don't know if that's two thirds of the way through this series or not, but uh, probably. Yeah. So, so we, anyway, tonight we're going to be uh, we're going to be reading "Let's Make Practical and Spiritual Sense," page two twenty six of Language of the Heart, and it, it looks like this is in response to a letter from somebody in the fellowship uh, to to the central office. So, uh, I, you know, I, I have no idea what Bill is going to talk about, but that's a great title, "Practical and Spiritual Sense," because. You know, some people can become so heavenly, they're no earthly good, right? You bet. Absolutely. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> let's get started. Yeah. Uh, the 1958 General Service Conference unanimously voted down a proposal for a paperback edition of the big book. That didn't last long because I remember no. when I started coming around, there were paperback versions of it. Sure. You, you kind of had to have that for jails and places like that. <clears throat> Believing that all A's should fully understand why this was done, Bill asked the grapevine to reprint portions of a letter he had written to an old friend on this long debated topic. So that kind of sets the stage here. This is August 1958. Dear Blank, it was fine to hear from you again. We old timers are getting more and more separated. My nostalgia for the old days is often with me, and letters like yours brings it back. You raised a time-tested question. What about a cheap edition of the AA book? Maybe a 50-cent paperback? This question raises a considerable number of other questions, having both a practical and spiritual bearing. First, let's take a look at the early history of the cheap book question. The issue of a low-priced book versus a high-priced one was seriously and heatedly debated for several years after the big book came out in 1939 at $3.50. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Monty, like $3.50 to you and me today, that's not even a Starbucks coffee. No. You, you know, but, but think about this. It, in, the, in the late 30s, you know, 1940 or something, that was probably like 60 bucks. Hmm. You, you, mm -hmm. in relative money you, you know it was like the cost of a a true textbook you know how how expensive expensive textbooks are so so think about it like that all of a sudden we have to pay and, and people were you know not handing them out <laughs> you know they yeah were, they, they, it was an expensive uh expensive item and and uh you know people were really hanging on to them so it says, in this era, the majority of AAs were doubtless in favor of a $1 job. When we announced the 350 price, the reaction was very strong and to some extent unreasonable. Bill had let AA down. The price is too high for the poor drunk. 
Since everything in AA is free, why not a giveaway book? Because AA is nonprofit, why should the groups in the New York headquarters make a profit? As for royalties to Dr. Bob and me, well, some said that made us profiteers, if not racketeers. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, Monty, you and I have you and I have talked about the flack Bill uh, got uh, yeah. back in the early days. Uh, you know, just trying to make enough money to 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 be able to provide for Lois. <laughs> he, yeah, to my knowledge, he was never wealthy. Uh, and uh, and and the small amount of money that he took for the royalties, that that was money he needed to survive so that he could be, you know, full time Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There's always there's always going to be those folks that think you're doing something that you're not doing, or that you should be doing something that you're not. I mean, it's always going to be the naysayers, right? Always. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it, but I had. A, I had a run in with a naysayer today that was something. <laughs> any, anyway, it says here, from the point of view of many of the membership, these were powerful arguments. A giveaway book was the purest kind of spiritual enterprise, but a volume decently bound and priced within the normal trade range, a volume which would help carry. Uh, the expenses of AA's headquarters was looked upon as a pretty fearsome evil. Consequently, I fell under the severest criticism of my whole life. So this is this is the first time Bill is really saying that people were coming after him because mm -hmm. it got bad. It was a combination. It was a combination of Clarence Snyder and Henry, Henrietta Cyberling, and all all these people were like coming at him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, here's, here's Bill setting the stage for probably the most important uh, transformational yeah. organization in the 20th century. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, and they're worried about like a, a the book costs a dollar too much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and Bill's robbing everybody. He's getting rich off AA, and there's this all this all this crap that really was coming from Akron is really where it was coming from. I'm not saying New York was blameless in this, but yeah. but uh, the ma the majority of the flack was was coming from Akron. So yet our history proves that the sometimes idealistic majority of that day was seriously mistaken. Had there been no book earnings for the headquarters and no royalties for Dr. Bob and me, AA would have taken a very different and probably disastrous course. Dr. Bob and Sister Ignatius could not have uh, looked after the 5,000 drunks in their hospital pioneering at Akron. I would have had to quit uh, full-time work 15 years ago. Our book would have been in the hands of an outside publisher. There could have been no 12 traditions and no general service conference financially crippled. The headquarters could not have spread AA around the world. Indeed, it might have folded up completely. So there's a good reason for, for adding a couple bucks to the price of the book. Yeah. And here's another thing. I'm going to say it, okay? I'm going to be Mr. Controversial and half the country will hate me. But, but Dr. Bob and Akron had as close to zero input into the big book as you can imagine, mm. All right? And Dr. Bob getting half the royalties, <laughs> you, you know, Dr. Bob and Bill getting like the same amount of royalties. Bill worked on this thing for, for almost a year, like full time. And there was, there was zero input from Akron. Yeah. You know, there, there'd be like, uh, uh, Bill would send out a chapter here, a chapter there for, you know, feedback. Oh, looks good to me, Bill. You know, right. everybody, everybody out there thought it was just, just a, just a stupid thing that Bill was doing. And so, so, so really New York is, is, is close to a hundred percent responsible for the book Alcoholics Anonymous as can possibly be with, with the exception of, you know, some input into some of the stories. Was there any, to your knowledge, was there any any bad feelings between Bill and Bob on that issue? I, you know, uh, they, I don't think they ever had an angry word between them. Mm -hmm. you know, they were co-founders of this thing. And Bob had a lot of respect for Bill, and Bill had a lot of respect for Bob. 
it usually, if, if there was criticism coming for a Akron, it usually was not Dr. Bob. It was usually people in the AA groups out there. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, did Dr. Bob think this might have been a boondoggle when it got started? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, think, I think if Dr. Bob knew at the time how important this book would become to the world, there would have been a whole lot more Akron input into it. You know yeah. What I mean? Yeah. It, here's a, here's a, here's a story that that is basically in the book, the writing of the big book. When they went to get the stories for the first edition from the people in Akron, they had a writer go out there and take these these uh, AA members, these group members, to lunch, and and tell tell their story to the guy who's taking them to the lunch. He was a writer. He went back and he wrote the story. And those are the stories that were put in the book. And I'm not even sure the people whose stories they were knew that they were going to have stories in the book. Oh, wow. That, that's how little wow. input, you know, Akron had. You know, I think most of them out there thought it was just another scheme or Bill is scheming sure. to make money or something. You, you, you know, wow. I mean, that might be, you know, over you know, overemphasizing, you know, yeah. negatively toward all this. But, but I mean, read the book, the writing of the big book. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's basically all in there. And some of the best historians I know, uh, uh, you know, a, agree with the position I have. So, so anyway. That's great. That being said, sorry, Akron. <laughs> uh, uh, I love Founders Day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, all of this would have come to pass had not uh, earnings from the big book plugged up the often large deficits in group uh, contributions to headquarters. In the 1945 to 50 period, for example, I saw our reserve fund of $100,000 drop to 40000 in three hectic, hectic years. In these years, the AA General Service Office and the AA Grapevine once reached a combined deficit of $3,000 a month. It was the book money that kept us afloat and enabled us to reorganize the service office and put today's general service conference into operation. A cheap AA book uh, would have been a practical and spiritual mistake of major proportions. The AA message would have been carried uh, to the few instead of the many. There is not the slightest doubt about it. Everyone who now wants a 50 cent paperback should bear this part of our history seriously in mind. Now remember, this is 1958. There, there's been there's been many big books. There's there's been mm -hmm. uh, uh, paperback, uh, you, you know, soft cover editions. There's been all kinds of stuff. So kind of the policy has changed. But what we need to pay attention to today, Monty, is when uh, when AA runs a deficit. Uh, a lot of times what they will do is they will raise the price of the big book. Yes. Now, here's the problem. The big book is being published by Anonymous Press. There, there's free downloads of the big book that you can get on your Kindle. You, you, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, I'm not sure they have access to that same, uh, same financial uh, methodology to, 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 keep, uh, to keep AA afloat. And I've heard, you know, heard tell that they've been dipping into their prudent reserve for, for quite a while now. Uh, one of the things that I've talked to you about, and I'll, I'll mention again, is a, what a lot of members are now doing is just like you would uh, pay uh, on, you, you would have automatic deposits for your electric right. bill or whatever. Uh, AAs are pledging $40 a month and, and it gets pulled out of their their bank account on the first or something and and uh and and the group contributions the contrib the dollar in the basket goes to things like rent for the church or whatever so so things are changing a little bit and and what we need to do as as good aa members if we believe that the mission of the central office is sound uh, and we want to support them is there's there's newer ways to support them now that uh, are, are worth exploring. I think it's, what is it, aa.org? Yes. Or, or something. I mean, it's not too yes. hard of a website to find. Right. And there's a, like a donate, uh, a, yep. a donate ab or something. So, so anyway, I'll put that pitch out there for. Uh, 
So I, I got a question for you. Uh, do, do you think that the average uh, attendee has any clue the amount of money that's in the prudent reserve? I doubt it. Uh, when I mention it sometimes in business meetings and things like that, yeah. eyebrows raise and they think I'm lying. I, yeah, yeah. I, but, I told somebody that in my home group the other day and I thought he was going to fall off his chair. <laughs> yeah, it, it's $18 million or something I yeah. heard from a, from a delegate. Yeah. Uh, so so when, you, when you look at the, when you look at how complex the organizations become, with its translation departments and its public service departments and the secretaries and, and you know, the amount of money they have to spend on the general service conference and all this, I guess it makes sense. And, and as any nonprofit has to, they, they provide uh, an annual report, which will have a financial breakdown in it. Yeah. Uh, that, I, I think that's a, a legal obligation. So, so any AA member that is, you know, wants to know where their dollar is going, you know, uh, <laughs> probably has access to that and, and, and can figure it out. So it says here, AA's trusteeship, our general service board has a reserve fund, which has been slowly accumulated out of book earnings over years. This fund is equal to one year's running expense of the headquarters. And I believe that, I believe the prudent reserve is one year, seven months to one year mm -hmm. operating. We think it is our chief protection against the hard times and the possibility of a large drop in group contributions. Even in good times, group contributions have often failed to pay the headquarters expenses by a considerable margin. If we could actually collect from every recovered AA member, notice the word recovered. Yes. <laughs> uh, the annual cost to each would be only $1 a year. Uh, so, so if you figure there was 500,000 alcoholics in 1958, $500,000 would be their annual expenses. Uh -huh. and it's 18 million now. So, you know, I guess that kind of makes financial sense. In practice, uh, we ask for $2 a member and average considerably less. The AA office ran $15,000 in the red in 1957, and the grapevine had an operating deficit of 10000 Since this is a frequent situation in good times, what would actually happen to us in hard times? You know, very interesting story. I, I, um, uh, I, I sponsor someone who was very, very active within the grapevine. He was a grapevine editor and was friends with the person who was, you know, the head of the grapevine, who became, head, became you know, the the CEO or whatever you want to call it of Alcoholics Anonymous for, for, for a long time. Uh, Greg, his name was. Uh, anyway, he, he, uh, he edited for Greg. And he told me some of the inside scoop on, uh, on the grapevine. The grapevine is like, they call it the, the meeting in print, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a great thing to send to jails or whatever for people who, you know, are wondering what Alcoholics Anonymous is like. I think that's fine. But, but it's, it's dull, for somebody like me. Yes, it is. It's just, for somebody like me, it's just really dull. You know, I drank like crazy. I got sober. AA is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I need to hear one more story like that like I needed a hole in the head. Right. I, I, need, to, I need to be practicing recovery principles so I don't pick up a drink is what I need to be mm -hmm. doing, right? I, I don't need to hear one more person's personal story. That really is for identification and and then assimilation purposes. Uh, but, you know, when I mentioned this to, to the editor, I said, why don't you spice it up? Why don't you do a step series? Why don't you do, you know, you know history of the big book series? Why don't you do something that a whole bunch of us would be really interested in? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we've talked about that. But the average age of a grapevine subscriber at that time was, was in their 60s. And he said, we are afraid of losing that group of people, the old timers, by changing anything at all. And I said, but you're losing money every year. And every year you lose more money. He goes, I know, I know. But the board is afraid of making any significant changes in it. Because there's such a small subscriber base, they're, they're afraid that they're going to lose those subscribers mm. and not gain any new ones. And, you know, so it's it's basically being operated out of uh, out of trepidation. Yeah. And, you know, 
the 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 innovation that could go into something like the grapevine is being hindered by uh, you, you know by uh, by apprehension uh, as far as uh, current sc- subscriber dynamics. So know. so I'll be honest with you. There there was a time when I subscribed to the AA grapevine. It has been a very long time since I've done that. Um, for that reason. Uh, I the 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 jokes in the comedic section are old. Uh, yeah. Everything, <laughs> I, there, it, there's just no substance to it. And the, the thing I find interesting is the steps and traditions are always printed inside, but um, it's kind of like going to a meeting and seeing them on the wall, but nothing being taught about them. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when when the the sole purpose of a of an AA group is the teaching and practice of the twelve steps, right? So. So if the grapevine is a meeting in print, you would expect some of that. But sure. I, I think they, I think they got flack from from uh, you know the, mm. the sixty eight year old median subscriber. You know when when they tried to do some of that. There's been a lot of back and forth about about uh, there, there's some uh, off color pages for, that that's gone through the history of the grapevine and where where they talked about science and data and research. And and that was a very controversial thing. I, I think they call them the, uh, the the white pages or the yellow pages or whatever in the back of the grapevine. Do you, do you remember that? Yes. And, you know, uh, and and they had a hard time. <laughs> they had a hard time with that. Uh, they went back and forth. I'm surprised. I'm surprised though. You would think that the old timers would be the ones that would want uh, some depth and weight. You would think. You yeah. Know, you would think. You would think that you know some of the some of the people who who are like the dynamic speak convention speakers and stuff could right. be asked to do you know articles and things and it would make it really interesting and but no yeah and, and listen it's not like there hasn't been great things published in the grapevine uh, uh, you, you know there's there's been there's been some some people who have contributed you know wonderful wonderful. Uh, Wonderful one for articles over the years. Some some of the real historic, you know, mm-hmm. alcoholic anonymous members. But you know, there are few and 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 far between. They, they, it looks like they want to they want to focus on diversity. You know, you know what I mean. There'll yeah. be there'll be a, a story from an from a, a Native American. There'll be a, a story from an Inuit. Uh, y- y- you know, uh, Yukon person. There'll be a story from an Australian. They, they, you, you know, it's like they're going after a massive amount of diversity rather than focusing on um, the teaching and practice of the 12 steps, which is supposed to be the sole purpose right. of, of, of an AA group, hence an AA meeting. <laughs> so, not, listen, not that I judge anything, Monty. You, you absolutely know uh, I criticize uh, no man. You, you know that, right? Well, absolutely. We're just making observations. <laughs> we're, just, we're just here to, to report. <laughs> oh, God. So it says here, in hard times, AA members of their groups will surely look after themselves. But in such circumstances, how well would they take care of general headquarters? Having never been through such a time, nobody can say. We can't even make an informed guess. We simply know that our headquarters still runs deficits. We also know that one-third of the AA group, representing 50,000 members, sends headquarters nothing, even in boom times. Let me, let me read that again, because I bet, that, I bet it's the same way. One third of AA groups send zero money to New York, and I'm I'm sure that it's probably even worse today, Monty. You know what I mean? Those small little little groups with five people. Yes. You know they're all over the place. Um, one of the things one of the things that intergroup was pushing in our area very very heavily was stop starting these small little groups. Support the really large groups. They were going around to all the groups and saying that. Really? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, we don't need fifty thousand groups with five people. We need five. We need five groups with fifty thousand people. Is really what they were saying. <laughs> and because they're going to get representative contributions from the larger groups. Yeah. 
you don't even follow the money. Anyway, we therefore have no reason to believe in Santa Claus. That is why we have insisted on building up our reserve fund. It is our primary protection against the impairment or collapse of AA's general services. Those services which have spread the good word throughout the world and which we ought to maintain in full strength under all conditions. There are those who feel that a 50 cent book would not seriously cut into the sales of our $4.50 edition. But would it not? Uh, at headquarters, we are finding many able volunteer service workers. Um, one of these is the vice president of a large book, book publishing house. He understands book markets inside and out. He emphatically points out that the ultra cheap AA books, especially paperbacks, would severely damage our present sales and income. Wouldn't it therefore be wise to ask ourselves, can we afford those cheap books now? Again, this is 1958. This is uh, times are different. Things have changed. Mm -hmm. There's been many, many, more, many votes have gone over the dam, you know, since this period of time. And and we have uh, all kinds of all kinds of books now uh, published by AA. And because they lost the copyright to the first and second edition, we've got a lot more. <laughs> you know, yeah, Marty, it... you, you could publish it if you want. The Monty Big Book, you could call it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't sue you, you know. They yeah, right, you. right. It, now, now there was a there was a copy of the first edition that came out a number of years ago, the yellow and orange yes. thing. Um, that was a reprint. I don't. Was that even published by AA? Or was that? Yes. Uh, it was yeah, okay. AA, I think in the beginning, uh, the anonymous press did one of those. AA soon saw uh, a missing piece of market share and published their own. And, and I, I have uh, I have one of those. It was like a 75 year edition, you know, yeah, 70, yeah. 50th anniversary edition or some, something like that. And uh, and yeah, I, you know, I, I love it. It's a it's an exact reprint of what what the first edition big book looked like, uh, uh, color and everything. Yeah. So. Uh, so AA at least didn't lose out on all that because millions of us bought it when we first saw it because it was so yep. cool. And, and we, and we couldn't mortgage our house to actually buy one. That, right. You know, <laughs> a, a real one. So, so, so it's, it's, it's like, uh, it, it, it's like uh, I've had bootleg Rolexes. So I, I had the bootleg Rolex Daytona, you know, because <laughs> there's no way I'm ever going to have one of those, right? But, you, but for 25 bucks in New York City, you can get a, you can get a knockoff. Well, I bought, I bought two of those suckers and they went right into my hands and right back out of my hands again. Uh, so I didn't even have one now, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't keep mine for long. I gave them to the kids. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. There, there's been some hope that the volume of 50 cent book sales would be so huge on the public market that we would not lose much money anyhow. But this is one of those situations on which no reliable estimate can be made. As AAs cannot go into new standard drugstore distribution, we would have had to let an outside publisher do the job for us. Such a publisher would be the sole source of supply. Even if such a paperback uh, house sold a million copies a year, the return to AA Publishing Incorporated in royalties and profits would not exceed $10,000. This estimate may, of course, be far too optimistic. A preliminary investigation among publishers indicates that such a sale is to be questioned. Horse Sense suggests this, too. And, and they never wanted to let go of the ability to print their mm -hmm. own their own literature. We've talked about that in mm -hmm. some of the previous, uh, previous essays. The main market for cheap back paperbacks is dominated by former bestsellers, murder mysteries, sex novels, science fiction, and the like. Large and sustained volume is possible because of the huge public interest. Now, the AA book has been on sale for almost 20 years in bookstores. Alcoholics Anonymous and its big book have received uh, vast advertising in all public media, and this still continues. Nevertheless, our sale to the public has never been more than a dribble. It hasn't averaged 1,500 copies a year. So how can we say we have any insurance that if we put a 50-cent AA book on the newsstands and in the drugstores, that sales are suddenly going to jump from 1,500 books to 1 million? 
or 100,000, or even 10,000. Nobody seems to be able to predict with confidence what a specialized textbook like ours would do if put on a cheap sale with whodunits and science fiction in these major outlets. Uh, textbook. Notice that he calls mm -hmm. the big book a textbook. If we did fail to sell a large volume, we would have mostly failed our spiritual purpose of carrying the AA message. Compared to the vast publicity that AA already gets, the effect of a chief book would not be very great in any sense. And, and I'll add this. He'll, he might add it later, but I'll add this now. That, that they found just inundating areas with the big book really doesn't do much for getting people sober. As with many textbooks, it has to be taught. Yes. You have to sit down. You have to be in a big book workshop or you have to have a sponsor who's going to be taking you through the big book to really get uh, really get an experience with it. Uh, I remember the first time I read the big book, I read it like it was the Da Vinci Code, like it was a novel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from page one all the way through, up, you know, took took me about a day and a half. I was in rehab. Okay, got that done. Yeah, and and nothing really sunk in. You know, you, you, you know, it was all it was all surface knowledge. It didn't propel me into a transformative experience. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. The first time I ever read it, I was incarcerated, and it was out of pure boredom. It was the only book available at the time. I just can't picture you incarcerated. I've known you a long time. You are so the reverse of anybody that, 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 that looks looks or acts criminal. That is so funny. I hear that a lot from people. They go, "Oh no, you're you're joshing yeah, us." No. Yeah, oh man. Let uh, let us inquire if there is any real shortage of AA books and reading material inside AA. Let's also ponder whether our, our poorest members are really deprived of their chance of, at the AA book because we still lack a 50-cent edition. You know and I know if somebody really needs a book, they get it from the group for free. Yes, they do. Also, whether our ex excellent pamphlet literature can, uh, cannot pretty well fill the need of such newcomers when necessary. We know, it, uh, we know that 350,000 AA books have already been distributed, and that a half a million good pamphlets hit AA members every year. Who knows anyone in AA that hasn't been given a book, who can't borrow a book, or who can't buy one from his group on partial payment, or find a big book in the local library? Hardly anyone need be deprived of reading the present volume if he will make a, even a little effort to lay hold of a copy. Of course, there are some exceptions, uh, but these are being met. We already send gift copies of the big book to prisons and institutional groups. And I really think that when they started to do the, the soft cover edition of the big book, I really think that was in reaction to, you know, you can use a big, you can use a hardcover book as a weapon in a prison and it's just harder to do it with a soft cover. So, so some wardens were, you know, excluding hardcover books. Mm -hmm. and, and so a soft cover book was, was finally printed. There might be certain spiritual advantages in a cheap, cheap book literature, but there would also be uh, definite spiritual disadvantages. There is the question of who is best able to pay for a given service, in this case, a giveaway book program. It is the individual AAs and the AA groups, or is it the AA as a whole? Obviously, the combined wealth and income of individual AA members is the real reservoir and source of money. The combined income of all alcoholics who have recovered in AA is easily $1 billion a year. That's in 1958. It's probably a trillion now. Compared with this, the money coming into our 7,000 AA group treasuries is a trickle. Compared to the funds that flow into local treasuries, the contributions to AA headquarters are a drop in the bucket. Our international treasury and the reserve fund doesn't contain even $1 for each alcoholic who has, who has recovered in AA. Neither do these alcoholics supply the, these reserve funds. The book buyers do. Probably half of the alcoholics who have recovered in AA over the years have never directly or indirectly sent a cent to headquarters. Maybe our headquarters financial statements look like big money to some, uh, but those monies represent only the tiniest fraction of the total wealth and earning power of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA headquarters, AA as a whole, if you like, is relatively as poor as a church mouse. 
Should the headquarters, the poorest part of AA, now undertake to finance the richest part, the individual AAs, with a 50-cent book? Does that make sense practically and spiritually? So, so this whole article was in response to somebody that wanted a 50-cent big book. <laughs> <laughs> but Bill had some wonderful points in here. Yeah, he me? does. Yeah. So uh, I had a sponsor who um, he had a, he had a pocket pocket copy of the big book and let me tell you that thing was in pieces like like my normal size one is falling apart that thing was falling apart he had that thing taped together duct taped together glued together back together again and i mean that was that was close to his heart but he carried that thing with him everywhere fishing Hiking, meetings, everything. He was never without it. And he'd pull that thing out like a like the rifleman would pull out his rifle, you know, if he needed to. He'd bring that thing out, and he'd go right to it. And I mean, he'd be sitting in a meeting, and often he would never read from it or anything, but he would, he'd be checking what the person was saying. He wanted to make sure that they were saying the truth. He had that sucker with him all the time. Um it, it, there's just something about watching a, a man like that, uh, you know, lead by example like that, that I, I really admire. And, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, hooray for the pocket editions. <laughs> so I want to finish up, Monty, with, with a story. It has to do with it has to do with a big book. OK, so so somebody I, I love very, very much in one of the groups. Uh, called me up and said, Chris, you know, we, we've, we've kind of, we're trying to resurrect this meeting. It's, you know, um, it's a meeting that had been around, but it kind of almost died off and everything. And, and he said, you know, what we've done is a whole bunch of us have come in and, you know, we had a group conscience and we changed it. We, we changed it to, uh, we changed the format of the group and we really think you'll like it. And it's more literature based. And, you know, would you, you know, would you, uh, uh, consider attending this group. And so I said, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I went to that group for about six or seven years when I lived in the area. And here's, here's the group history. Long, long ago, it was one of the first big book groups there was. And then there was a group conscience somewhere, somewhere in the 70s. And it turned into a 12 and 12 group. And then it became a discussion meeting sometime in the 80s, right? And then, uh, and then by the time I got there, it was, it was, a, it was around 2015, 2012, 2015. And, uh, uh, and they had turned it back into a big book meeting. Uh, there, was, there was a group conscience, as it, as it was in the beginning. So, uh, so I got in there and I got involved and I said, you know, you, know, do you want me to buy a case of, of, of big books? If we're going to be a big book meeting, we really should have them available. You want me to get a, you want me to get a case of big books and the, the treasury can pay me back over time or whatever, right? And uh, and somebody in the group goes, you know what? I was looking back in the closet, and you know th this was a big book meeting way back when. I think there's still I think there's still boxes of big books back in the closet. So I head in that direction, all right? <laughs> and, and I start I start you know taking boxes out, and sure enough, they're way down at the bottom, way in the back of this closet. And you know what, Monty? Boxes of second edition big books. Wow. Boxes of second edition big books. So, so I did what 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 any spiritually ethical person would do. I said, "Listen, I'll take these off your hands and I'll replace them with some new big books." How does that sound, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, "Fine." And, and I got like two cases of second. Edition. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Now, now, the whole next section is on practice these principles in all our affairs, Monty. Yes. You know, I, just, I, want, I want to set the stage with just how, just how ethical I, I, would, I, I will say this. You know, in all seriousness, I gave them, I gave them all away. You know? Yeah. There are people who, there, there were big book people who would really appreciate them. And to just use them as, a, as meeting books, you know, wouldn't have been appropriate. So uh, I don't feel too bad. Oh my goodness! Is it common out where you are for for meetings to have uh, like a big book and a twelve by twelve, and maybe another piece of literature every so many feet on the tables? So, so what's what's traditional in our area is 
you'll have somebody in charge of literature and it's kind of up to them to get pamphlets and order big books and, have yeah. 12 and, 12 and all the other a conference approved literature but but every once in a while you'll get these people who want to put a lot of hazelton literature literature out they want to, they want to put the road less traveled you know they want to put all the all the codependency books and all that stuff out and and there is uh there there's a there's a, a tradition a tradition in our area that you, you separate those so so that the conference approved literature is not mistaken for I'm okay, you're okay or something. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. You know, the reason I asked was I, uh, I was I was at a, a meeting in Tacoma, Washington years ago, and it was one of those meetings where you got to you got to walk through a dark dungeony kind of indoor alleyway to get to the room you know kind of thing and and the doors creak and the stairs creak it's just really old building and then it opened up into this this room uh and everything was really old you could smell the wood i mean and they had i think it was as bill sees it a big book and a 12 by 12 and then you know sugar and creamer on both sides and then a few more feet the same thing a few more feet the same thing so so there was always you know a literature within reach of anybody and huh. uh i mean it was it was and, and the room was filled like that there was several tables um and i'd never seen anything like that nor since um but it was pretty impressive you know, each group is autonomous. You, yeah. You know, there, there's there's a there's a bunch of bunch of people who really think that this is the way to do it, and this group, well, that's the way to do it. You know, I think as long as long as as, uh, as people are following uh, the basic traditions, the concepts, and personally the steps, I, I think there is a lot of latitude to sure. personalize a space. You know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's that's the cool thing. We really don't have any any oversight alcohol is our oversight <laughs> if, we, if we get too far out of bounds alcohol is there you gonna go be, uh, gonna gonna be the uh, uh the judge jury and the executioner all right so next week we venture into part three of this book uh 1958 to 1970 and as uh as chris mentioned in all our affairs is where we're going to go into and uh yeah so there you go listeners uh make sure you listen to the end of this broadcast to figure out how you can catch up on uh all 62 this is this is episode 62 Woo! i'm telling you yeah. yeah so you can download them as always for fun and for free until our next broadcast this is the monty man along with chris s and we are wishing God's perfect serenity for you. For more recovery workshops with Chris S. and the Monty Man, visit our website at take12radio.com and click on the Recovery Workshops banner. This has been a broadcast of Take 12 Recovery Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. This has been a chicken and a pig production. Kitty, 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 kitty. Meow, meow, meow. Woof, woof.